for us here at Ballyholm Presbyterian Church, as for hundreds of millions of Christians around the world, the Bible is a life-defining book. In fact, it's the life-defining book. Every week, Christians gather to hear the Bible, sing the Bible, pray the Bible, and obey the Bible. Many Christians devote their life's work to teaching the Bible or translating it into other languages. And throughout history, many Christians, when given the chance to renounce the teachings of the Bible, have preferred death. The Bible has so profoundly shaped the church that the Quran calls Christians the people of the book. But why? Why give such importance to a collection of books written by dozens of people in three different languages several thousand years ago? In this series, I'm exploring the doctrine of Scripture, what we believe about the Bible. God speaks through the Bible into our lives. He speaks about our lives, but more importantly, he speaks about the true life that only comes from him. Today, we're going to consider the amazing doctrine of Revelation. God makes himself known to us, which is tremendously important because we can never guess what he tells us. So let's get started because we've got a lot to learn. And we'll start by speaking to the God who speaks to us. Let's pray. Almighty God, the bedrock of all truth and the origin of all knowledge, we confess our ignorance and the limitations of our understanding. Although we know many things, although we may be experts in some things, the sum total of our knowledge is but a drop in the ocean of all that might be known. What we do know, we know uncertainly, and at times we suppress or ignore certain truths that we find uncongenial to our desires. Shine the light of your truth upon us, we pray. May the same Holy Holy Spirit by whom you inspired the scriptures So illuminate our minds that we might come to true and certain knowledge of your divine being and of ourselves as we live before you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are going to start today with a reading, which is found from chapter 19 of the book of Psalms. It is a very classic statement of part of what we're going to be talking about today, the, the doctrine of revelation of General revelation and of special revelation. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In the heavens... God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Next up is a song. We are going to play the recording of 10,000 Reasons that we did in the church a while back, and then we'll go on to talking about God's revelation to us.
When the Bible was written, there were no mobile phones. If you wanted to talk with someone, you had to be in their presence. There were no airplanes, cars, or bicycles. The, f the horse was the fastest way from A to B. There were no explosives, GPS, chemotherapy, central heating, electric lights, antibiotics, or indoor plumbing. They hadn't discovered representative democracy, the language of human rights, the theory of evolution, or even the fact that the earth revolves around the sun. I mean, for goodness sake, they thought that the heavens were a solid dome above the earth that you could bump into if you could fly high enough. You wouldn't listen to what an ancient Hebrew had to say about astrophysics. You would ignore a first century Jew's opinions on macroeconomics or microbiology. So why on earth would you pay attention to what they'd say about the even bigger questions about the meaning of life? Why would you arrange and structure your life around their religious opinions? Surely, unless we're professional scholars, we've got better things to do with our time than to scrutinize the assorted writings of pre-scientific primitive people. In other words, just ignore the Bible because it's obsolete. Can you feel the force of those arguments? They are powerful because they tap into secret hidden assumptions that nearly all of us make. We know that science is important. We have received millions of amazing benefits through technology, which ultimately comes from scientific knowledge of the physical world. How else could I talk here in my living room, have people listen to me much later, as often as they like, nearly anywhere in the world? It's simply incredible. By applying scientific investigation into the physical world, we have greatly extended, extended our range of activity and multiplied human capacity. But we can easily assume that progress in every aspect of life is as inevitable as techn technological process. You know, you start with a biplane and you work your way up to a stealth bomber. You replace your iPhone or your car every so often for something slightly faster or more efficient. Many people assume that the progress we see in scientific discovery and technological achievement is only an instance of a far greater march of progress towards utopia. You know, if we educate people well and put in place the right democratic institutions, then all of life will improve. We'll learn not to be racist, sexist, or snobs. We'll all tolerantly accept everyone's life cho choices and will certainly not get on the wrong side of history. Anything but the wrong side of history. And that phrase says it all, doesn't it? As if history is somehow a story of unmitigated progress, where everything old is on the wrong side and everything new is on the right side. And our quest for knowledge and education will inevitably result in an ideal world. Unfortunately, that analogy between technological process and moral progress is false. It is empirically untenable. Technology these days allows us to kill each other with ghastly efficiency, and we don't seem to be able to stop ourselves. In fact, the horrific violence that the world has seen over the last 150 years strongly suggests that technological progress and weaponry has made humanity's lack of moral progress towards justice and mercy absolutely indisputable. The casualties of war, tragically, are too many to count, not to mention the innocent victims of troubles, terrorism, firebombing, nuclear warfare, cultural revolutions, purges, genocides, ethnic cleansings, and, you know, that's just the open warfare. I haven't begun to mention gender-based violence, abortion that ta targets baby girls or disabled babies, the one-child policy enforced by the most technocratic empire in history, radical inequality, deforestation, human-caused climate change, and many more problems caused by us that are certainly not getting any better. The evidence that science doesn't make us better people is plain to see. It's inside of us too, that evidence. I can't say that having a smartphone has made me a better man. The truth is serious and depressing. But it's always better to face up to the truth than to ignore it. In fact, I'm here to give good news. There is a better path than the one we're taking right now. We can be honest. We don't have to pretend that we're making moral progress when clearly we're not. 
Of course, the instant we admit that we haven't got a monopoly on moral knowledge, simply because we're the most recent people to be born, then we can't use the oldness of the Bible as a reasonable argument against it. Oldness or newness is irrelevant to the greater question of truth. Now, so far, I haven't actually argued that the Bible is true. I have simply argued that one of the biggest objections to the way Christians use the Bible is unsustainable. Namely, that our ability to send rockets into space does not necessarily make the Bible, or other ancient books for that matter, outdated or obsolete with respect to claims that lie outside the domain of the sciences. Claims about God and eternity, right and wrong, good and evil, and, and so forth. The sciences, for all their good and worthy uses, have significant limitations. By definition, science deals with physical matter, with atoms and their particles, things that, at least in principle, can be physically perce perceived and measured. Claims regarding God and whatnot are, are what we call metaphysical claims, claims that go beyond the domain of physical matter. You can't touch justice. You can't measure peace in the same way you can measure, say, the acidity of a glass of orange juice. Science, by its very nature, cannot speak with authority on metaphysical questions. Scientific knowledge can produce an atomic bomb, or it can produce a cure of cancer. But what it can't do is say why one is better than the other. For that, we have to turn to some other mode of inquiry. Of course, someone might object. Someone might say, look, the, the Bible might say true things about the meaning of life, but it also claims miracles happen, which is totally unscientific. But the whole point of miracles is that they reveal an all-powerful God who does what is otherwise impossible. Or just to put the same thing differently, miracles depart significantly from the natural processes that are the subject of scientific inquiry. So for example, take the feeding of the 5,000. Those present were mostly farmers and fishermen who knew by brute experience just how much work it takes to get food from the earth. The simple fact that we today can describe plants with a lot more scientific precision doesn't mean those people then were totally ignorant. Actually, they knew in some ways better than we do that what Jesus had done was ordinarily impossible. They weren't gullible or stupid. They reacted with amazement and astonishment, just like we would. Miracles happen when God circumvents ordinary natural processes, and miracles astonish their witnesses precisely because they're extraordinary. Science can say nothing like this has ever been seen before, but it can't reasonably add, therefore it never happened. Not when an omnipotent God is involved. Another objection that the, might be that, that the Bible contains statements about the physical world that are scientifically dubious. And people in the Bible do hold pre-scientific beliefs about nature. They occasionally make pre-scientific statements. Next week, I'll talk about how the Bible came to be, which will help us better understand what to do with some of those pre-scientific statements. But I'll give a hint now. We speak of the doctrine of accommodation. God graciously accommodates himself to our human weaknesses, both to our finitude, which means our physical limitations as finite and created beings, as well as our fallenness, our moral limitations as sinners. God kindly meets us as we are without requiring us to be perfect. John Calvin famously describes accommodation with the analogy of baby talk. We don't speak to babies like I'm speaking to you right now, fortunately. We don't torment them with the fullness of our knowledge. We make silly faces, we make funny noises, we play peekaboo. We communicate so that the babies can understand us and that helps them to grow and develop. Now, when God inspired pre-scientific people to write the Bible, he did not require to master he did not require them to master for example a knowledge of astronomy that was just unavailable in their day we'll consider this more later but god didn't select as the inspired writers of scripture people who know everything and had the right opinions about everything quite plainly some of them didn't 
but God accommodated himself to them, just as he accommodates himself to us and to our own biases and failures. Because, of course, we're as limited in our own ways as ancient peoples were in theirs. Now, when God was inspiring the Bible, he did so in such a way, he accommodated himself in such a way as to reveal himself with perfect clarity and accuracy and truthfulness. But that means that I'm not troubled by the fact that God didn't suddenly and temporarily turn ancient Hebrews into 21st century Northern Irish folks when they were writing the Bible. Despite their limitations, God still managed to use them to write an infallible book. The basic Christian claim about the Bible is that it is the written word of God. We believe that God speaks through the Bible, and we'll discuss what that, what that means in later weeks. I've been arguing so far that the most common objections to our claim are untenable. Science is good, it's useful, but it is not competent to investigate metaphysical claims about God and how he relates to people. And humanity is not caught up in some grand march of progress to a perfect future. So we cannot just say that the Bible's claims are false simply because they're old. There may be things in the Bible that we find baffling or jarring, but even those things testify to the kindness of God who works alongside frail people like ourselves. So to say that the Bible is the written word of God certainly lies within the bounds of possibility. The nature of the claims that the Bible makes, and especially the supremely important claim that God became a man who was raised from the dead in order that we also might be raised from the dead to eternal life, that claim and the other claims makes the Bible worthy of thorough investigation. If it's false, then it is duping gullible people like me with false hopes. But if it's true, then above all else, the Bible and the truths it contains is worth knowing. So we're going to start our investigation by thinking in general terms about why God even gave us the Bible in the first place. We'll begin with the doctrine of revelation. That simply means that God reveals himself to us. He makes himself known to us. Interestingly, the Bible never attempts to prove God's existence. It just assumes that God exists, and it narrates his relationship to people. Astonishingly, the Bible tells us of a God who is keen to relate to people, who passionately desires that people should know him and love him, even as he knows them and loves them. The Bible also assumes that it's not straightforward for us to know God. God is infinite. He's uncontained. He's invisible. He's untouchable. He's a spirit. And that means that he has no body that occupies space or can be perceived through our physical senses. We do have bodies. And we have no way of accessing anything except through our bodies. So there would appear to be an abyss or a chasm between ourselves and God. By our very nature as creatures, we cannot access the divine creator who is entirely distinct from what he has made. That means if we are to know God, he must make himself known. But he wants to be known. And he has already done so. He has always already revealed himself. And the story of humanity cannot be separated from the story of revelation. From the instant he created us, God has been revealing himself to us. He has been crossing that chasm so that we as finite mortals can know the infinite God. Thankfully, God does not reveal himself in the fullness of his majestic being. If he did, we would not survive the experience. The writer of Hebrews calls God a consuming fire. God told Moses that no one can see his face and live. Ezekiel saw a vision of the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord and was totally overwhelmed for a week. Normally in the Bible, whenever God presented himself to the physical senses of a person, that person reacted in fear. And the greater the, dis the difference between God's self-presentation and what humans normally perceive, the greater the fear. So, when God reveals himself to us, he accommodates the mode of revelation to our human condition. 
Aside from the rare occasions in the Bible where God appears before someone in physical form of some sort or another, he reveals himself in two broad ways. The first way we call general revelation. God reveals himself generally to people in general. Any person, regardless of where they are born or what religion they're raised under, knows that there is a creator God who is worthy of worship and who has placed expectations on how people ought to live. As the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God and their voice goes out into all the earth. As Paul says in Romans chapter 1, God has made his eternal might and power known through creation. God reveals himself through creation, although people suppress that knowledge. People's powers of suppression are considerable. Watch, for example, any nature documentary. They reduce, just to take an example at random, the beauty of birds of paradise to a bare function of sexual selection. The logic being, they're so beautiful in order that they can mate. This ignores the obvious fact that sparrows and crows also seem to mate, but more importantly, it overlooks how the extravagant beauty of the birds of paradise points to something far beyond natural selection and mating behaviors. It points to a God who delights in beauty. Now, as well as remain revealing himself through creation, God also places in each person an innate or inborn notion that he exists. Paul pointed that out in Acts chapter 17. God, he says, made people to be natural worshipers. If we don't worship God, we'll make up something to worship. So in Acts 17, the Athenians were worshiping an, an altar to the unknown God. History and anthropology show that everyone worships something. Calvin, again, calls this inner drive to worship the seed of religion or the sense of divinity. As Christians, we can enjoy general revelation. We can love the glimpses of God we catch in the beauty of a flying swallow or of the full moon. We can let them lead us into greater worship and understanding of God. As the poet Lucy Hutchinson put it, we can examine even the intricacy of the veins on a leaf and, to, to quote her, to read in every line lectures of providence. So general revelation is useful. But general revelation alone can only push us towards God. It can only make us grope for him in the darkness. We can guess that he exists, that he is good, that he is wise, and so on. We can even begin to worship ignorantly the unknown God. But we cannot begin to worship him adequately as he wants to be worshipped. In their ignorance, people end up worshipping statues of cows or their ancestors or karma, power, sexual experience. General revelation will never lead to anything like the Christian church. Nor can we learn through creation or through our sense of divinity that God is triune, that he relates to us through covenants, that he became incarnate in the person of Jesus, that he works through weakness and so on. Our unaided powers of thought and observation couldn't hope to discern these truths. Although general revelation, as far as it goes, is accurate and reliable, for God couldn't disclose himself otherwise, it is insufficient to our needs. So God also reveals himself in what we call special revelation. Special here doesn't mean that he reveals himself to special people who are more deserving than others. That is clearly not the case. Rather, special is used in the sense of being better or greater or out of the ordinary. Christmas dinner is a special dinner. It is better and greater than an ordinary dinner. And in the same way, special revelation is better and greater than ordinary general revelation. The entire life of Jesus was the unsurpassed and supreme act of special revelation, where God appeared in human flesh and very clearly told people who God is and what he's like what he expects of our behavior, how we should talk with him, what he intends to do in the future. As the writer of Hebrews puts it, in the past, God spoke through prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. For the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. 
Or, as Paul says in Colossians, Jesus is the image of the unseen God. But now that Jesus has ascended into heaven, the Bible is the only authoritative form of special revelation that we can access. Even if God speaks to us in dreams or visions, as he does, we can forget or misinterpret, and no one else can access them in any meaningful sense. But the Bible is different. The Bible is for everyone. It is a set text in a fixed form. Anyone can look at it and study it. The church can do so together. And the Bible is full of everything that we need to know about God if we are to live fully the life that he intends for us. That is why we can be confident in reading the Bible. God wants to tell us all about himself, and he's chosen to do it with this book. He caused everything he wanted people to know about himself to be written down in the pages of Scripture. Whether those people are ancient Hebrews or medieval Italians or 21st century Northern Irish folks, God reveals himself to them in the Bible. Now, sure, our culture changes every day. I cannot possibly keep up with the pace of the change of the world. But the character of God doesn't change, and neither does our, our need for Jesus the Redeemer. Basically, my smartphone hasn't made my Bible obsolete. Jesus put it like this, heaven and earth will pass away, but God's written word will never pass away. And the reason for that is because in God's written word, we come to know God as he has revealed himself to us. We are going to end now with a short prayer. God, thanks that you reach out to us in many ways. Thanks that we can see your fingerprints all over the world. Thanks that we have an abiding instinct to pursue you. Thanks that you pursue us even when we suppress the evidence that you've given. Thanks for the times you've made yourself known in our lives. Thanks for the amazing gift of scripture, that treasury of reliable knowledge of you and of ourselves. And above all, Thanks for revealing yourself and your son, Jesus Christ, who is the radiance of your glory and the exact representation of your being. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me over the last few minutes. We're nearly done, but before we go, let me remind you of this one thing. We don't study the Bible to know more. We study to love more. The end point of all our work in faith is worship. So as we finish, I hope we can all join the psalmist in saying to God, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than the honey to my mouth. Now, I hope you'll, be, you'll, you'll join with me next week when I will be talking about the doctrine of inspiration or how we got the Bible. And until then, may God hold you in the palm of his hand.